fifth lesson is from the book of Isaiah. This is what the Lord God says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. To open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them unto you. Also from Isaiah, our second lesson. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you. And His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. And from Psalm, let us read responsibly from Psalm 72. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your glory with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear you as long as the sun and the moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the grass of the poor dwelling, like showers that water the earth. In his days the righteous self shall flourish in abundance of peace until the moon is no more. He shall have the dominion of all the circles to the sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you. From now until Ash Wednesday. So uh, uh, what, uh, what does Epiphany mean? Close. Yes, in so many words. It, actually, what it means literally is proving. But uh, it, it means essentially revealing. Revealing. And in the season of Epiphany, our lectionary texts us to the passages where Jesus Christ is revealed. Why the, who, the, who the person of and the uh, ministry of and the purpose of Christ is revealed to the nations. And uh, the, uh, the first... Uh, well, the, le the lesson that is most often taught on the Sunday is the story of the Magi. Uh, which, which gospel is that in? So we're in Matthew. No. And uh, we, we've added this morning the, uh, another uh, epiphany passage in Luke 2, the story of old <coughs> Simeon. What gospel is that in? Luke. Yeah, it's interesting. The shepherds and the angels are only in Luke. The wise men and the flight to Egypt are only in Matthew. Uh, this drives scholars nuts. Uh, so uh, we're going to read first of all from Luke chapter 2. Let's turn to that. Luke chapter 2. This story of old Simeon. Got my big old King James here today. It's actually my big old new King James. Uh, Luke chapter 2 beginning at uh, verse 22. I'll, I'll get, begin at verse 21. Luke 2.21. When eight days were completed, this is just after the shepherds went back to their flocks, praising and glorifying God. When eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. What's the Hebrew equivalent of Jesus? Joshua. Joshua. What is Joshua, Jesus, Yeshua, what do they mean? Jehovah will save. Jehovah will save. Remember the angel said, you will call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Okay? 
Uh, now, now, verse 22. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And right there, those first three verses of that passage, we have a, a instructive glimpse into three ancient traditions in Israel among the Hebrews. Uh, regarding childbirth, okay? So the first one, uh, verse 21, uh, on the eighth day, or at least by the eighth day, pra, how do you spell circumcision? I can see, right? I'll pretend like I don't know. Well, I mean, like you don't know. Circumcision of male infants on the eighth day. All right? Uh, now, that goes back to Genesis chapter 17. I think... I want us to learn some of these things. Let's, let's hold your finger there in Luke 2 and flip back to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17. This is the sign of the covenant. All right? Uh, see right there, it says verse 9. Uh, verse 9. God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Colon, every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you and your descendants in the flesh of your foreskins. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child who is in your generation he was born in your house or bought with money from uh, any foreigner who was not in your descendant, not your descendant. He who was born in your house and he who was bought, brought with your money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child, verse 14, who was not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So there was... Uh, no discussion about whether or not circumcision makes sense, like the, the ongoing conversation now, whether it's a good thing or not, or not now. Uh, if you were a Hebrew boy, or a, a Hebrew, a male brought into a Hebrew household, no matter how old you were, you had to be circumcised. And so, we're getting a glimpse here that Mary and Joseph were very devout and obedient. And on the eighth day after Jesus' birth, in spite of the traumatic surface uh, circumstances regarding his birth. I can hear young couples today, oh, we can't, eight days is too soon. You know, we can't, we can't get out of the house for two, three weeks. Eight day. It's about uh, six, seven miles from Bethlehem to, to Jerusalem. All right. So, uh, there's one. Now, verse 22. Purification rites for the women. And you feminists are going to love this passage. The purification rites for women after giving birth. Yeah. Um... The uh, Hebrew law was patriarchal with the Catholic people. Let's turn to Leviticus 12. Hold your finger in Luke 2. <coughs> Leviticus chapter 12. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers. Leviticus 12, 1 to 8. Uh... And in my uh, King James Bible, it's headed uh, the ritual after childbirth. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman is conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. What was her customary impurity? I'm being delicate here, I know. Yeah, menstrual period, right. She was unclean. She could not, anything she touched was unclean. Did I tell you the story of my favorite book of last year? The Year of Living Biblically? This is a great story. I hope I tell it well. It's a story, it's a true story. It's, a, it's a, written by a journalist who decided to set aside one year of his life to live according to the law. Actually, it was going to be eight months according to the law and four months according to, to a, the New Testament, the law of Christ. He's not a Christian. Uh, and in fact, he's kind of an agnostic, but he has great respect for his family religion. Anyway, when it comes to this point, um, when um, he, he, he took this very seriously, by the way, he met with rabbis and priests and ministers and got their input with them regularly. 
And when he came to Leviticus 12, he was living in New York City. He took the subway everywhere, and he realized that, you know, there's probably an unclean woman sitting on every seat in the subway. <laughs> so he got himself a, one of those collapsible stools. It looks like a it looked like a staff. He felt more a bit more biblical with it. His beard's growing by the day, the big long Levitical beard, and he wouldn't cut off the curls of it because it's in the, in the scriptures. And he, he would sit on the stool to keep clean. When his wife got word of this, she was incensed. And so when he came home one day, uh, he had a long day at the office, and he came to where the plop down his chair. She said, "Don't sit there. I sat there this morning. It is my period." She said, "Well, thanks." So he goes to the dining room table and pulls chair. Don't sit there either. I sat there also. In fact, I sat in every hat chair in this house. He laid on the bed, too. <laughs> he dealt with that in ways that was a very funny book. And it's actually quite reverent. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I recommend it with that reservation. It's called The Year of Living Biblically. It's quite funny. And it's not the least bit of any description. Not, not at all. It's really quite funny. It's really kind of It's really kind of cool. But, uh, so, uh, if you have a male child, you're unclean. For seven days, uh, you can't touch anything, you can't touch anything sacred. Anything you touch becomes defiled, ladies. If you think that's bad, let's continue. Verse 5, but if she bears a female child, then she's unclean for two weeks. As in her customary impurity, and she'll, she shall continue in the blood of her purification 66 days. When the days of the purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering, to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Specified sacrifices. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. And she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. She is defiled by her own blood, according to the Hebrew law. This is the law for her who has born a male or a female. Verse 8 is, is interesting. If she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves. Twelve days of Christmas, that's where it comes from. Two turtle doves. Uh, two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one as a burnt offering and the other as a sin offering, so the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be clean. So, uh, without getting into a discussion of how patriarchal the Hebrew law was, let's get back to Luke chapter 2. So, uh, we have verse uh, 22 again. When the days of her purification, Mary, according to the law of Moses, were completed. So this could be anywhere between 7 and 66 days, as far as I can tell. My guess is it was the 8th day, the same day he was circumcised. We, don't, we weren't told that. Uh, they, uh, she went to the, they went to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. There's the third, there's the third tradition. The consecration of a, any male child who opens the womb. So if your firstborn child is a male, that child shall be presented to the Lord for consecration. Now that is not the same thing as dedication. Alright? Every male child is circumcised and thereby dedicated to the Lord in the Hebrew faith. Only the firstborn male child, the male who was the firstborn child, was consecrated. What does consecrated mean? Dedicated. means more than that. that. That's included to be sure, but it's so much more intense than that. What does consecrated mean? Set aside. Set aside completely for the Lord. Where do we see this happen in the scripture before this? Samuel. Hannah. Remember Hannah? Barren for years and years and years. Prayed for a child. Prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for a child. Finally got a child. And as soon as the child was weaned, she took him to the temple and gave him literally to the Lord. After all those years of waiting. And that is what consecration means literally. It means given solely to the Lord. It became more complicated if you were a Nazarite. Remember the Nazarite vow of Samson? Also Samuel, I think, was a Nazarite which included lots of things you couldn't do after that. But you were given to the Lord, and consecrated means reserved for the Lord's special use, no matter what it is. In the Old Testament, we hear of cities, whole cities, that are consecrated for abomination by them to God. They are consecrated for destruction by God, by God's command. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to read. 
but Jesus was the first child born to Mary. Many Roman Catholics believe he was the only child born to Mary. In fact, one of the interesting doctrines of Catholic Church is the belief that Mary was a perpetual virgin, that she that her womb was never over Mary. Well, in this life, basically. Uh, uh, but uh, circumcision of male children, uh, purification of women, and uh, consecration of the male child. So, uh, they're doing their religious duties, verse 25. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout. Whenever you read a phrase like that in the Bible, it means that this man was regarded by all of us, somebody who was really, really good, really devout, really pious. We don't use that word pious enough anymore. Uh, we see it as kind of a negative thing now. Oh, he's so pious. It's actually a wonderful thing. A person whose life is defined whose activities are really informed and defined by his or her dedication to God. And so this is how Simeon is, this is how Noah was described. He was a man who was just and devout, a man who was righteous. It doesn't mean he was perfect, it means that his life was, was a living sacrifice, a testimony to his devotion to God. Uh, they brought him to present him to the Lord, oh, pardon me, verse uh, 25, a man named Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Capital C, capital I. Waiting. What does the word consolation mean? When you, con when you console someone, what do you do? Listen. That's part yes, that's, I think the key word there is comfort. Yes, exactly. That's part of it. You try to bring them comfort. One of the great Advent passages. Comfort, comfort my people, God said to us. To Prophet. Console my people. And it is one of the hardest jobs a pastor or any church members have to do is to offer comfort to someone who needs consolation. We, we don't know what to say. We, we, we sometimes wind up saying stupid things. We don't mean any harm by them, but they come out awkwardly and they don't help at all. But that is a powerful ministry in the church, is giving consolation, is giving comfort. And he is waiting, Simeon is, for, I've never seen this phrase before, for the consolation of Israel. He continues, the, the writer continues, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. All right? Now before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit didn't come on everybody. It came on select people for select purposes. And we're told here that Simeon had the Holy Spirit upon him. And verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So Simeon had been told directly, had a personal revelation from God, that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ. Now that had been waited for for hundreds and hundreds of years by the nation. And here is God pointing to one man, says you will not die until you see the Messiah. The prophets have talked about all these centuries. You'll see him. So he came, verse 27, to this by the Spirit to the temple. So we're told that the Holy Spirit led Simeon to the temple on this particular day. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, uh, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. Simeon takes the baby in his arms. It's a great painting by Rembrandt that shows this. Uh, and he says this. Now what he says has been immortalized in liturgy as the nunc dimittis. If you're a Roman Catholic, you know this. If you're a Lutheran, you might know this. Uh, it's, it is essentially, it, it means now dismiss in Latin. Now dismiss in the immediate authorized version. Now the Lord dismiss your servant in peace. Here it is, the, the Song of Simeon, verse 29. It's beautiful poetry. Uh, Lord, you are now letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people to Israel. I've, had, I've heard that read at funerals before. Uh, the Nunc Dimittis, it's in front of all prayer books also. Now, uh, here, imagine being the parents of the baby Jesus. You've, you've had quite a week already. <laughs> I guess quite a couple of months. Uh, you've had to leave your hometown by uh, government edict. You've had to make an arduous journey across the uh, wastelands to your childhood home with your wife who was great with child. Uh, the journey or her time, whatever happened together, gets by her. when she gets there, she's ready to deliver. You wind up having the baby in a, in a manger, which is a cradle crib. I mean, a corn <coughs> essentially a 
eating trough. And you have this strange visit by a bunch of shepherds. And, it's, and then uh, you're trying to keep your, your religious stuff straight, so you're going to go to Jerusalem, take care of all this business. And now you're walking to the temple, close to the end of your stuff. And here's this old man you've never seen before who takes your child and makes this extraordinary declaration as prayer. I'm sure they're speechless. In verse uh, 33, Joseph and his mother marveled, I guess, at those, at those things, uh, which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them. This is not part of the nook. Not part of the nook divinus. This is separate. He blesses Mary and Joseph. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. That's not a very promising prophecy. Uh, not everybody is going to welcome this child that I have just given God thanks for. In fact, he'll be the cause not only for the rise of many in Israel, but the fall of many in Israel. And then this, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. He said that to Mary. What in the world was she going to make of that? What, what does that mean? That the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. So the prophecy that Jesus, this child, the Christ, will be the uh, destined for the fall of rising of many in the, uh, in the nation of Israel, the sign which will be spoken against, the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed because of him, through him, by means of him, and a sword will pierce your own soul. That's all this unfolds here. And that's the last we hear of soon. But here is Mary and Joseph getting a glimpse. They've already had some hints. I mean, of course, the enunciation to Mary, she's, she's bearing a child while she's yet a virgin. My guess is Joseph had been wrestling with that ever since. And now the visit by these shepherds who come in and, and say they've had a visit from an angel who has told them that this is the Savior, this is the promised Messiah, and these shepherds worship their infant baby just hours apparently after he was born. And now eight days later, this old man, this revered old man in the temple, uh, lifts up the son and, uh, and tells, thanks God for him and tells them a great prophecy about his future. Cloud and just enough mystery to make it a prophecy. And they leave, I'm sure the old man Joseph is scratching his beard like, what, what next? Well, what did come next? Might have been a few months, might have been a few weeks, probably as much as two years. And what came next was a visit from Magi. All right? So before we go to Matthew chapter 2, the story of the Magi, uh, I want to give anybody, anybody who likes poetry, you should take one of these. One of my favorite po poets is T.S. Eliot. Uh, Eliot was born in St. Louis in 1888. He was the son of a Unitarian minister. And um, uh, his family had been from New England for generations. They moved to St. Louis before he was born. He always resented that. He, he really liked his Anglo-Saxon roots. He moved to England in 1914 and stayed there the rest of his life. So a lot of folks think he's, think, think he's British. He's an American-born poet. And he had a lot of personal struggles in his life. Uh, before uh, 1920 or so, his wife got very, very sick, and he became her caregiver. At the same time, he's exploring coming back to his family's ancient faith. I mean, he's not Unitarian, he was an atheist. He, he begins to explore religion by visiting churches, and he winds up converting to, to the Anglican faith, speaking of Justin, and uh, became, as his poetry became infused with not the certainty he had arrived to because he became a Christian, which so many people think is the normal thing. I don't agree with that. It is the wrestling with your life in light of what you're learning and being shown about God and Christ. You're, you're wrestling with stuff. When something terrible happens, it, 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 your faith takes a hit. When something uncalled for, it seems to you, happens, it's like, what? I, I'm a Christian. Why did this happen? And we, we wrestle. And, and Eliot just poured out in his in his poetry. And it just so happens, uh, he wrote two brilliant poems, in my opinion, uh, one about Simeon and one about the Magi. So I, I, I ran this off for you today, so if you want to take one, please do. If you don't, just pass it on back. And uh, here is uh, his poem, uh, A Song for Simeon. And then from this we'll go to uh, Magi. 
Uh, Lord, the Roman hyacinths are blooming in bowls, and the winter sun creeps by the snow hills. The stubborn season had made stand. My life is light, waiting for the death wind, like a feather on the back of my hand. Dust in sunlight and memory in corners, wait for the wind that chills toward the dead land. Grant us thy peace. I have walked many years in this city, kept faith and fast, provided for the poor, have given and taken honor and ease. There never, there went never any rejected from my door. Who shall remember my house? Where shall my, where shall live my children's children when the time of sorrow is come? They will take to the goat's path and the fox's home, fleeing from the foreign faces and the foreign swords. Before the time of cords and scourges and lamentation, grant us thy peace. Before the stations of the mountains of desolation, before the certain hour of maternal sorrow, now at this birth season of decease, let the infant, the still unspeaking and unspoken word, grant Israel's consolation to one who has 80 years and no tomorrow. According to thy word, they shall praise thee and suffer in every generation with glory and derision, light upon light, mounting the saints' stair. Not for me the martyrdom, the ecstasy of thought and prayer. Not for me the ultimate vision. Grant me thy peace. And a sword shall pierce thy heart, thine also. I am tired of my own life and the lives of those after me. I am dying in my own death and the deaths of those after me. Let thy servant depart, having seen thy salvation. Where there is a mixture of hope, uncertainty, devotion, and risk. So I find it that. So that's for your edification for what is worth it is not scripture. It is DSA. Now, the Magi. Uh, who can tell me the story? Someone just tell me the story of the Magi. I know you know it. They saw a star in the east. Where is the east? Depends on where they were. Depends. <laughs> Good answer, Jim. <laughs> Okay, they saw a star in the east. They followed the star to... They actually followed the star to Jerusalem. Not right, which was west. Yeah, they followed... They saw a star while they were in the east and traveled west. They, it, you know, a lot of traditions have been built up. For example, okay, there is, who were these guys? Uh, they were magi. Uh, the song, We Three Kings, uh, I, I think is... Uh, well, they might have been true in certain cultures. Uh, it's pretty, we're pretty sure they weren't kings. Uh, probably comes from a number 24, but uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I say 60, uh, where uh, the prophet, like, kings will come to your rising. And so they, they kind of the hymn has kind of applied that to the song. Uh, we three kings of Orient, probably not. They were magi. The Greek word is magi, uh, which means more than magician, but it can mean magician. Uh, magi was, in certain cultures, were a culture of priests. Uh, you had special knowledge. And a lot of that knowledge came from astrology. And that astrology was important in those days because in those days, remember, the guiding ethic was the Earth was the center of the universe. So the movement of all the planets uh, was uh, uh, due to the, uh, uh, the prominence of the Earth. And so astrologers gained lots of information, uh, secret information, I suppose, they felt, uh, from the movement of the planets, which they studied uh, by studying the heavens. Now, where were they from? Uh, some scholars say Persia, which is modern-day Iran. Uh, many scholars guess Babylon. Uh, they guess Babylon because of Daniel. Remember, Daniel was taken into captivity and brought the Hebrew faith with him to Babylon. He stayed in Babylon, lived his entire adult life in Babylon, and became an important person in the government. And a large Jewish contingent stayed there, and so there was a Jewish presence and the presence of Hebrew theology in Babylon that mixed with all the other faiths. And so this would have informed wise men who knew about all religion. They were, they were aware of the Hebrew scriptures. Now, if it was Babylon, that's a 900-mile trip to Jerusalem. 
Which means they didn't see the star the night Jesus was born. If they did, they didn't get there later that evening. Uh, so many scholars surmise, and there's, there's all kinds of hints at this, I suppose. I've not told them about it. I've done the research. Most people suggest around two years after the birth of Jesus, the Magi show up. Uh, we'll read the passage in a second. Now, uh, how many were there? We three kings of Orion are. Well, no, no one doesn't say there were three. It says there were three gifts, right? And uh, most scholars believe a 900 mile journey would have been a huge caravan. There might have been a dozen or more magi. Maybe there were only three, we don't know. We guess there was a huge party of people and servants and, and uh, camel trainers and Lord knows what. But I mean, that was apparently a, because they came to a big city, Jerusalem, and made a big splash. It wasn't just three guys right in town with camels. Having more than that, I think. So, let's go to Matthew 2. Verse 1. It's interesting. Matthew is very economical in his uh, uh, description of Jesus' birth. There's no mention of a manger or of shepherds or angels. But he goes to great lengths with this story. Matthew chapter 2. Uh, now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king. Okay, who was Herod? Yeah, he was the king. The king of what? Palestine was under Roman rule. Herod was named sort of like a governor in 40 BC, it was 37 BC, by the Roman government. And he was kind of their man on the scene. They controlled Israel, which they called Palestine. And uh, uh, Herod liked to think of himself as the king of the Jews. He wasn't even full blooded Jew. Uh, most of the Jews hated him because he was half uh, Idumean. Uh, he wasn't even a pure, purebred, a purebred a Jew, and he was ruthless. William Barclay's commentary on Matthew talks about Herod. Gad zooks. I mean, he murdered his mother. He murdered his mother-in-law. Most, almost all of his kids. He was just one of the one of history's great villains. He was very jealous of his position and never lost his fear of losing it because he wasn't really people's favorite. Even though he spent a lot of money and did some really good things as far as the government leader is concerned, and one of the things was the temple. He built the temple. Uh, but uh, he was quite, pretty much a rascal. So uh, Matthew places this at the time when Herod was the king. Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Well, if you're Herod, that's not good news. Uh, wait, who, what? Uh, for we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Now, we have no notion if the Magi thought that this was the Israel's Messiah. They might have. It appears they did. But one thing we can say, they came to, to uh, see the, the birth of a brand new king. And it must be a special king because we saw this sign in the heavens. What did they see? Well, it might have been a natural phenomenon. They, I, I saw a really cool video last year where some, some uh, astrophysicist, that's what Otto Berg is, you know, uh, uses all this historical data and biblical data and actually pinpoints a, a moment in time which is so in keeping with the scripture account that it's, it's amazing about this, this heavenly gathering of planets. It, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's on record. It is not a matter of conjecture that around 5 to 7 BC there was this amazing sign in the heavens that involved three planets aligning up from the Earth perspective, particularly right there in the Middle East. That's where you would have seen it most clearly. They, they've determined that also. Uh, that uh, would have been uh, unavoidable. You'd had to notice it. Okay, it could have been that. Could have been a special star. I mean, I think like that when the star told them where Bethlehem was. I mean, you know, when you see a star, you see a star in the heavens, if it were Jupiter and Saturn and Mars, that didn't over anything, you know, specifically, is it? It's, you, you keep on going. And, all right, so, so they see a sign, so it might have been a special star. It might even have been an angel. In the early church, they believe it was an angel in the form of a star. They go back to the Exodus to talk about that. So we don't know. There was something spectacular that these magi saw, and they interpreted it as, in keeping with what they heard about the, the Hebrew faith, about this Messiah, uh, they, the timing was seemed to seem to be right, and they decided we should go check out this birth. 
Yes. I mean, yeah. Star. I have a really hard time with it being a natural phenomenon because of that. The star guided them. Yes. It's like, okay. Anyway, where the star guided them, by the way, was not to Bethlehem. It was to Jerusalem, where Herod was king. Let's go. Let's keep this competing. Uh, when, Her okay, when Herod heard this, he was troubled. Verse 3, and all Jerusalem with them. This was big news in the town. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ had been born, or were, were to be born. So he grabbed, he got together all his religious scholars and said, "These guys are talking about a newborn king. Uh, where is that going to happen?" And so these scribes, they knew their Bible, if you will. They said to him, "In Bethlehem, of course, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this thus it is written by the prophet." What prophet? Micah. Micah, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star had appeared. We aren't told, but he was. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. When you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. Now listen, he told them, okay, the baby you're looking for is in Bethlehem, which is about six miles that way. But the next verse we are told, um, where are we? Verse 9. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. So Herod's directions are verified once again by the star. This is where I depart from the ones who think it's a natural phenomenon because the star appears and apparently shines down on Bethlehem. So Sarah Herod said it's there. They look, they start out, look. The star verifies that this is where it's going to happen. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother. Notice they come into the house, not the shed, not the manger. They come into the house. They saw the young child with Mary his mother, and the young child, not the babe, fell down and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, ancient records say these were common gifts given to kings. On big occasions, you brought them gold, Solomon, for example. You brought them incense for all the religious ceremonies and all their, their coronation ceremonies. And you brought them myrrh, which was a perfume resin alloy that was used for all sorts of purposes, including embalming. It wasn't embalming. Uh, when you died in that period of time, you had to be buried within three days. Why? Because you started to smell. Uh, also, because it was just the tradition. And so they always put in some myrrh in your coffin so it wouldn't smell so bad. All right, so a very suitable gift for one who was going to pierce the soul of Mary, don't you think? Uh, one who was the king of the Jews. Uh, and when they come to the house, they would they give him his, first they worshipped, then they gave him their gifts. Then being, a, then being divinely warned in a dream, verse 12, uh, that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. And one scholar gives a great alternate route back to the heaven line of the south. It took them, taking them well out of their way. But they got a dream. We weren't told what they were told exactly, but they were given a sign, don't go back there, don't go back that way. Uh, Herod should not know when you leave. And so what happened after this, by the way? Since Herod got, was infuriated, he got, he got uh, smoked by the, uh, the, uh, the uh, wise men, he ordered his soldiers to kill every male child in Bethlehem. Uh, how did Jesus escape? Joseph got word and dream. They go to Egypt. And scholars surmise they probably used the gold. In order to finance their trip and their life in Egypt, which could have been two more years. Two years old, no, right, exactly. That's the, that's, that's the key. Thanks, Susie. That's why they think it was two years, two year journey, because Herod killed every male child who was two years old or younger. That's why. Thanks, Susie. Uh, and uh, Anne Rice, good book, Out of Egypt, uh, a novelization of Jesus' life as a, as a, as a, as a toddler in Egypt. Interesting book. Anne Rice, interesting person, by the way. Very good. Okay, got that? Any, any, any thoughts or comments you want to share with us about this familiar story which we love so much? So go home, your nativity scene has wide men in it, throw it out. Just, otherwise, it's, it's heretical. We, we just like the idea of them all being there in major, but they are wise men work. Yes? They're consecrated. They're consecrated. I'll say. You have a, a 
special point in time. We have a, a special star. We have a special group of men that very well may have been prepared for this more than 100 years before their birth. Exactly. And a society that is, I, I think maybe these people were set apart. You said they could be more racist. And they're certainly wise men. There's no separation between science and religion, the creation and the creator exactly. of the creation. Exactly. Okay? They're, 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 this is a special thing for a special point in time. They're not just a bunch of intellectuals that got together on camels and traveled for a year across mountains. Amen. Excellent observation. Yeah, they were consecrated. I mean, this is this is all divinely appointed. Now, I mentioned before, T.S. Eliot wrote uh, a song for Simeon. He also wrote Journey of the Magi. Uh, which is one of my favorite poems, and one of the strangest ones you'll ever hear. And we had Eric all primed to read it Christmas Eve. And we got to throw it out, so I've asked Eric to read it to us this morning, Eric. Sure. So the back side of your, your flyer. Uh, remember, these, these folks came probably from Babylon, the home of Nebuchadnezzar, the ancient gardens, wonder of the ancient world, extravagance beyond belief, not just that rugged territory you've seen on the uh, TV for the last 15 years. So you're going to see a little bit of this in the last two paragraphs. And you're going to see the results of the epiphany in the last two paragraphs. So, The Journey of the Magi by T.S. Eliot. Well, Eric, may, may I just butt in one more obvious thing? Forgive me. Sure. Uh, this is, the, the conceit here is that it's being told by one of the Magi. Oh, yes. Years later. Years later. As he's an old man thinking back on that event. Okay. A cold coming we had of it. Just the worst time of year for a journey. And such a long journey. The way is deep, the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And the camels galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men, cursing and grumbling and running away, and wanting their liquor and women, the night fires going out and the lack of shelters, the cities hostile, the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end we preferred to travel all night sleeping in snatches with the voices singing in our ears saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn we came down to a temperate valley, wet, below the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a water mill beating the darkness and three trees on the low sky. An old white horse galloped away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel, six hands at the door dicing for pieces of silver and feet kicking the empty wineskins, but there was no information. And so we continued and arrived at evening not a moment too soon, finding the place, uh, as you might say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago, I remember. And I would do it again, but set down this, set down this, were we led all that way for birth or death. There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death. But I had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad for another death. Thank you, Eric. Well done. Uh, what do we learn from this? I mean, sometimes these stories are told and retold so often that we just let them be told and don't give them a single passing. What lesson can we, this year, 2013, on this Sunday, what lesson can we take with us into the new calendar year from the story of Simeon, the story of the match, both familiar verses, passages of Scripture? Anyone? I you talk about the magi, I don't think you mentioned the day unless I would just bring the that possibly they had been influenced by them or yeah. 
his training, his teaching, and, and the people that followed him, he was a very godly man. Uh, and it, it shows me that God's word is not with him. Thank you, amen. Remember Simeon's also. Simeon said, this child will be a light to enlighten the Gentiles. Maybe nothing astonished Mary and Joseph more than those words. But the Gentiles, remember, were seen by the Hebrew priests as fodder for the fires of hell. That's about it. And to say this, well, why is were Gentiles? And so the epiphany right at the beginning, the revealing, the proving of Christ, is made there in the Gentile world, and they return to their homes. And my guess is the gospel spreads there too. Good news for what they had seen. So, uh, there, good deal. Thank you. Anyone else? I think of it as being um, Christians, we need to set an example, and the way we live could affect a non believer. Sure. So, you know, be careful for nothing. Yeah. If I do something wrong, it's going to affect me. <laughs> Someone around me. So we see sad evidence to that truth almost weekly in the newspapers when some Christian says something or does something in the name of Christ and makes a slap her head and go, oh, me, why don't you just shut up? She okay. whiz. It happens all the time, right? Um, promises cap. Excellent. Prophecies fulfilled. Yeah. And it can make us think into the future for ourselves, you know, that there will be a time when Christ comes back. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I appreciate so much about about Advent and about Eliot's poetry. I mean, in that poem that Eric read is not only a, re a poetic recounting of the, the visit, but looks into the future. I mean, those three low trees, surely that's an image of three crosses of Galilee. Yeah. And the idea that uh, after the time of mourning, uh, the people who follow this child will, will be glorified and will suffer. I mean, all these, you know, the, the whole true big picture, which is not nearly so neat and clean and tight and bundled as we'd like to make it, it's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery, and God gives us glimpses, all the glimpses we need to continue to live by faith. Now, uh, here we see, listen, I'll, I'll pose this, three responses to the manifestation, to the epiphany of Christ in the story of the Magi. First, you have, you have the response of Herod which is blatant opposition. Herod wanted no part of this new king of the Jews. He felt threatened by him, and his response to the announcement, the epiphany of his birth, was wipe it out. All right? And we live in a world that has many pockets of opposition no less violent than that. Uh, there's a huge space now given in popular literature and, uh, and nonfiction to a whole new genre of writing, which is not just atheism that says, I just can't believe all that nonsense. Atheism, which attacks the faith. The, the Richard Dawson's of the world, these, they attack the faith as not only not true, but destructive and bad, the cause of all the world's troubles. And they would include Christianity with all, with all the rest. Now you have the response of these learned scribes and scholars of Herod's. They knew the scriptures when he asked them. He didn't know. Where's, okay, where's he going to be born? And they said, well, yeah, everyone knows that in Bethlehem. But that meant nothing to them. They knew that as scholars, but it meant nothing to them. And so their response was indifference. And folks, in many ways, that is a much more destructive response to Christ than opposition. And in so many cases, we have churches full of indifferent Christians. Who, as Bev said, they're just by the, the stuff of their lives, you would never know that they have faith in God through Jesus Christ. You would never know they have this power called the Holy Spirit that gives them the, the divine power to not sin when their body says yes. It's remarkable. The indifference is a, another response. And then, of course, you have the response of the wise men, which was adoration. And I use that word on purpose because adoration is more than just getting down on your knees and worshiping and giving your gifts. Those are important. But that's only part of adoration. Let's close with Jesus' words in Luke 6. I'm going to start. It says here verse 46. I'm starting verse 43. This is Jesus talking just after the Beatitudes. He's talking to his disciples. 
He's not preaching to a crowd. He's talking to his disciples. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. We've seen that in our lifetime. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And then he talks to his disciples a little more intently here, verse 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream, the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Notice in that, in that lesson, Jesus says, the storms come to both lives. The rain beats against the house built on the foundation and the one not built on the foundation. Hard times come for everybody. Sorrow and struggle are strangers to no one, no matter how religious or not religious. But the house whose foundation is built on the rock, the storm can't shake it. It might tremble. It might make a loud noise as the wind beats against the window panes, but it's not going anywhere. Good lesson for us. Remember? Curse of over familiarity and the curse of indifference. Lord, deliver us as a church. Thank you, Lord, for these lessons and for a good Christmas season for the church. We pray, Lord, that you guide us into the new year as individual Christians determined to strengthen our faith in your word, Lord, to commit to the fellowship that exists in this church family, to commit to the ministry of the word in this church. And Father, as a church, lead us, Father, to do what you would have us do this year in this place. Guide us and direct us. We pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said. Amen. Amen. Amen.